episode, we had begun to unravel the incredible story of Lipa. How in 1948, Teresita Castillo, a young girl who had run away from home to become a Carmelite nun, received visits first from an entity she believed was the devil, and then from a lady who later identified herself as Mary, Mediatrix of All Grace. The Mediatrix spoke of prayer, penance, humility, the rosary, and concern for fallen souls, especially those of priests and nuns. During this period, the fragrance of flowers would fill the air, and rose petals would materialize out of nowhere, and fall on the grounds, rooms, and even blanket the stairway of the convent. Privy to all these events was Mother Mary Cecilia of Jesus, who happened to be the mistress of novices and prioress of Carmel at the same time. Another protagonist was the Carmelite chaplain and auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of Lipa, Monsignor Alfredo Obiar. He in turn would report to the bishop of the diocese, Monsignor Alfredo Versosa, who angered by the events and the public attention that Carmel had begun to attract, went to Lipa to put an end to everything but was himself greeted by a shower of petals and, as a result, had a change of heart. Carmel rapidly became a national passion, with thousands streaming from all parts of the country to the convent grounds, and a replica of the statue of Mary Mediatrix was born in procession in New York and Madrid amidst crowds of enthusiastic devotees. In those heady years, crowds repeatedly witnessed petals falling from the sky, and there were reports of a spinning sun, a moving statue, and a host of marvelous cures and conversions. Masses, novenas, and rosaries were said at the shrine, and a church called the Chapel of Mary Mediatrix of All Grace was erected on the convent grounds, funded entirely by public donations. Like most places where reports of the supernatural abound, Lipa was not spared from commercialism and the rush of opportunists anxious to cash in on the events. Restaurants and stalls selling all matter of religious items sprung up around the city. At the height of the showers, fake petal rackets mushroomed and petals were supposedly on sale at the then staggering cost of 30 pesos apiece. The Carmelite nuns also had to deal with unauthorized solicitation purportedly on their behalf. Whether because of the rampant commercialism or some other aspect of the events, certain sectors of the Catholic Church hierarchy were not pleased. In this second half of the Keithley Report on Lipa, we focus on the investigation that followed the reported apparitions, the results of which were to bring a rapid and abrupt end to what had been a most extraordinary phenomenon. Barely a year after the onset of the petal showers, Carmel Lipa suffered the first in a series of setbacks. On January 23, 1950, though he had not reached the mandatory age of retirement from office, Bishop Alfredo Versosa was suddenly relieved of the administration of the Diocese of Lipa. After 33 years of dedication, catechetical work, and active service, he remained Bishop of Lipa in name only. Virtually all powers of one of the largest and richest dioceses of the Philippines was transferred into the hands of an apostolic administrator. I was present when he was reading the letter that came from the Holy See. And uh, the immediate reaction of the old bishop was, uh, we were all standing around him, he was sitting on the sofa, and then he said, this letter really came from the Holy Father. He was saying it in Spanish. Of course, the two Monsignor Santos and Monsignor Bagnosi say, well, of course, you know, we came here to bring you precisely to intimate it to you, to, to let you know, you know. And that's what his answer is. 
If it came from the Holy Father and it is written from the Holy Father, I have nothing to do but to bow my head and obey the Holy Father. But if this is not from the Holy Father, and he's alluding maybe something might come from somebody, he said, we will see it. Talk was that he had been replaced because he had allowed public enthusiasm to grow around the phenomenon of Lipa. Sometimes other bishops, friends, say, why do you not be strong in prohibiting this? No? You know, the, the, what the late bishop said, say, well, what power do I have? If it, this is really from heaven, I cannot do anything. If the people are uh, uh, receiving special graces or whatever this, they are saying that they are receiving this, I cannot prevent them. Say. That's why I neither will, will say no more, no, a drastic uh, measure like that. Because this is what he said. If this is of God's, no human power can stop it. But according to Father Juan Coronel, then Chancellor of the Diocese of Lipa, Versosa was replaced because he had mismanaged the economic affairs of the diocese and that his removal had nothing to do with the events at Lipa Carmel. No relation at all. They say that uh, during all those years of Portuguese administering the Diocese of Lipa, it seems that the diocese became bankrupt, no? But uh, I know also personally that he became bankrupt and even his family, who is a very well-to-do family in Began, became bankrupt because he was spending, he was so good. Extant documents of the Chancery of the Diocese at Lipa seem to buttress Pedernal's assessment of Versosa's irreproachable character. Though Versosa may have been thought a poor administrator, he excelled in the primary duty of his office, which was to bring more souls to the faith. For he focused on establishing catechetical centers and sending catechists throughout the far-flung corners of his diocese. And records nevertheless show that prior to his relief, he was engaged in the reconstruction of the churches that had been leveled by the war, and that the first installment of the war damage claim was used to settle these debts and to finance the needs of various religious orders. I have been telling you there was a vested interest because they know sooner or later Bishop Bessosa was going to retire and there were people in Manila, of course, priests or Monsignor were interested. Church, Church of God run by men. It may never be known for certain what cost the bishop his seat, whether it was age, economic mismanagement, vested interests, or the fact that he had permitted public enthusiasm around Lipa to burgeon into a virtual national passion. He has since passed away, and surviving accounts and testimonies somehow seem to be in conflict. Bishop Versosa was replaced by Monsignor Rufino Santos, and it was under his authority that an official church commission was formed to investigate the apparitions at Lipa. As far as we know, all materials and documents in the Philippines have been burned or destroyed, and none can be found within the files of the Arsobispados of Lipa, Manila, and the Nunchatur. We know that a Carmelite father was sent by their generalate in Rome to conduct an investigation among the Carmelite nuns. And according to our sources at the Vatican, this was due to a request sent by Monsignor Vagnozzi, then still just a papal delegate to the Philippines. As far as can be determined, based upon the recollections of Terra Singh, other testimonies, and of newspaper clippings of the time, the local commission was made up of psychologist Father Angelo Blas, rector of the University of Santo Tomas, psychiatrist Dr. Leopoldo Pardo, Father Ortega, Monsignor Artemio Casas, and Monsignor Santos. When the investigation began, the distribution of petals was stopped and the release of official statements from Carmel on the apparitions put to a halt. The conduct of the investigation and its results, however, caused the congregation and the visionary much pain. Mother Cecilia, the visionary's primary confidant, and reportedly too a recipient of interior locutions, soon shared the fate of the Bishop of Lipa. 
On February 27, 1950, she was suddenly unexplainably replaced as prioress and mistress of Carmel. The whole community summoned to go to the choir, and so all of us went there. And then after, Monsignor Santos was in the middle and said, you will have another prioress from now on. Here is Mother Mary of Christ, and Sister Magdalene, Magdalene to be your mistress, because we can't say anything. And then she addressed Mother Cecilia and said, and you, Mother Cecilia, I'm giving you half an hour to pack your things. And no more. No more than that. So she left. I did not see her go because we were all told to, to wait there in the choir. And I did not know what happened. And, and I did not even know. I, I, I knew that she was going because it was announced to us. But the way she, she left, I did not see. When she left, I madre. I I don't know why. But I was full. I was, was really full na, na ano kaya, what's the next, why? I was, I was full inside, thinking, bakit kaya? Did Mother Cecilia do anything wrong or something? Ganon, ano nga. Hindi ako, hindi ako napaiyak talaga. I just prayed about the others talaga umiiyak. And then when I was in the choir for meditation, there, that was the time I started to cry. My first was happening was that when our mother was, taken and we did not know where she would stay and she just left us and then secondly of course we know mother mary of christ by name but we do not really know her personally and of course that was a big pain for each and every one of us but then I, I can see that the sisters were a little bit bang kabado siguro ha something like that umiyak malimit umiyak ganun and then i did not know till later na na uh, ito pa lang si Mother Cecilia was brought to Haro Haro Cardinal they said it was for investigation also in the meantime, the sudden reassignment of Mother Marianne Kuna, sub-prioress and infirmarian of Lipa, caused her family considerable consternation. Nawala siya. Isang may panahon na hindi namin nalaman kung saan siya nandu doon. Tinatanong namin kung nasaan, hindi rin nila alam, sabi ng Marka Carmelite. She was told to ask then-papal delegate Monsignor Ehidio Vagnosi regarding the whereabouts of her sister. Pumunta naman ako sa kanya, no? Umiiyak ako, sabi ko, Monsignor, sabi ko gano'n. Gusto ko lang malamang kung nasan yung kapatid ko, si Mother Mary Ann. Ngayon sabi niya, ah, sasabihin ko na lang sa'yo kung kailan mo siya pwedeng makita. Perhaps the second most important witness to the occurrences at Lipa was Bishop Oviar. As Auxiliary Bishop of Lipa and Chaplain of Carmel, he had closely monitored all the developments, had allowed the nuns to commission a statue, approve the release of the apparition story and messages to the public, and had even blessed the groundbreaking and foundation of the new Carmelite chapel. Oviar too was relieved of his position. He stayed on in Lipa at the family residence in a sort of limbo, so to speak, and only after a year was assigned to the Diocese of Lucena, demoted to the rank of Apostolic Administrator. So we, we were like that, and until that time that the investigators came over. And so we were, uh, we were investigated one by one. There are no records of when this investigation at Carmel took place. Terry Singh remembers being questioned by Monsignor Artemio Casas and Father Ortega. Sister Elizabeth and Mother Mary also remember being questioned, but others claim they were not. I was never questioned. No, never. Never. Maybe if it happened these days, it would have been very much easier because you can ask questions now, huh? even from the priors, you can ask, you can have a dialogue, but that time you cannot. So we remained um, in, in doubt all the time, hanging in the air, not knowing what the next step will be in one meeting of the novices. 
and we were talking about that and said yun pala even mother virus can be picked up like that how much more us we were telling like that so all of us were really scared in the time eh, hindi na kayo ako nang susunod sabi ko naman <laughs> because it, I'm the one um, connected with this case Harris Singh was right. Soon afterwards, the postulant was picked up by Monsignor Santos and, chaperoned by Sister Stephanie, brought to the hospital of the University of Santo Tomas in Manila. Him, bakit may sakit ba ako? I wanted to ask him, bakit ako dinala dito? May sakit ba ako? Ganun, no? But as use one mortification of the tongue, you see, because they say that when you mortify interior feelings like that, that is ano, yang better than any uh, external instrument of penance. That's much, much better, yung interior. So I, did, I kept my mouth shut. Terry Singh was subsequently interrogated at UST by psychologist Father Angelo Blas and a noted psychiatrist, Dr. Leopoldo Pardo. Father Blas was the first to question her. And he started asking me, do you have a tendency in the family, do you have a tendency? Na, or do you have a member of your family who became insane? <laughs> I said, not that I know of, Father, I said. Or any sickness, say, of the head or the nerves or something like that. I said, well, Headaches, oh yes, father, I said, but other diseases, I don't know. The accusation of a lesbian relationship with Mother Cecilia also resurfaced. Three hours, I was, he was pounding on me for three hours. I kept, I kept, I was quiet, but I, I was firm with my, my statements. So he took one piece of paper and then, he gave it to me. Now sign that, he said. So, I, Father, I will have to read it first. So I read it. And it says there that everything is a hoax, a fraud, and all my imaginations because I just want to be popular, um, to be loved like that. And so I did not sign. Father, I said, I'm sorry, I cannot sign this. I said, why? Because what what you what you have written here, Father? It's not true, eh? Sabi ko, what I'm telling you is true, but what you're telling here is not true. So how do you expect me, naman, Father? Please, I said I cannot really. Then he 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 got he got mad. He got mad with me, and he stood up. Merong ashtray yan, eh? <laughs> and he took hold of the ashtray, and sabi ko. Katapat ko lang, hindi ko na babato yata to sa akin. I was just thinking that way. I was holding and he, he had no cigarettes naman. So I said, babato yata to. So I was telling to myself like that. So when he stood up, I changed my, I changed, no? I left my, the place, my place and I, 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 I went a little bit towards the right side, the left side. Sure enough, the, the astray flew. And so, I started to shake. My knees were shaking talaga. Oh, siguro, somebody saw me. I was very pale, siguro. I feel that way. Na. I was pale and my knees started to, to give way. I said, why don't you like to sign the father? I said, I cannot really sign. I how about, I said, kindly tell uh, Monsignor uh, Santos to kindly come here. Because I need him. So, facing siya, ganyan, ha, nakaganyan yung kamay. And, and then he said, you know, he said, that, do you know that even Carmelites can imagine things? I said, yes, Father. And then, do you know that being a Carmelite contemplative order 
has it has more tendency to imagine than active orders. I did not say anything to him. And so when when we were like that, Father, I said, I'm not feeling well because I felt I was going to faint. I said, I'm not feeling well. No, they could kill again. So <laughs> I told him, and I'm not telling a lie. I told him that. If you want to punish me, you can send me out if you like, but I'm, but I'm not telling a lie. I told him that. He did not, he did not believe. So he left me. I was asking for blessing. Did that bless me? And so I told Sister Stephanie, she did not equal to Mr. Santos because I was really crying. Na. And Mr. Santos came the following day and I was crying. And so I told him like that. And he will be back yet, he said. I said, no, why you hold on? It's not good, it's not normal food. Then because he asked me to sign something that, that's not true. And I really told him, I swear before that I'm not telling a lie. I said, Sabi niya, it, it has to be. It has to be, ika. Sabi ko naman, oh, sige na lang, oh, sige nga. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he arrived the next day. And then, oh, did you not change your mind? What the signature I'm asking you? I said, no. I said, no, Father. Even if you come back here 20 or 100 times, I'm going to change my mind. Two days later, it was Dr. Pardo's turn. Well, I suppose, I suppose a psychiatrist should act that way. That's what I mean. He made me, he made me feel that, as though I'm out of my mind, as though I'm an insane. Okay, you know, sabi, basta give me the grace, no? You know, sabi ko, Mama Mary, just give me the grace, like that. And then, so, Dr. Pardo shouted at me, kick the chair inside the room. And I'm, I was sorry about Sister Stephanie was not there. Pinalabas. Sana nandun siya so he could, she could testify nga. Yan, no, no, no. And, and so, sabi niya, doon ba sa pamilya mo, walang loka-loka? He really made me like a fool. Sabi, pero, Ang allowance ko lang, he's just doing his job. That's, yun, that, that's what, that was what, that, that was the grace that was given to me to understand them. And so, I said, if you like, I said, you can, you can go to Batangas. And then, you, you can, you can uh, ask the Batangas there, I said, if, in our family, eh, kahit isa, eh, kung merong in insanity in our blood, I said. Then if you will find one, I will surrender all my, 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 ano, yung, my consent and everything. Yun naman, si Dr. Pardo. He, he, he wanted me to, to, uh, to tell him that uh, I was under strain because of my brother. And then, and my family, and and that was the one that triggered off this all these things. That 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 was what he wanted me to do. Ako na mai say hindi naman hindi naman doctor. It is not like that. I don't think so. But hey, have, have, do you know what will happen to you when you enter Carmel? No, I said no. Oh, if I knew nga saan, I will not enter anymore. Dr. Pardo and Father Blas are both dead. There are no documents to prove that they had resorted to intimidation or that they had presented Terra Singh with a false document to sign. And as far as can be deduced, there were no other witnesses to the questioning. In all probability, 
taking into consideration testimonies of those who knew their character, both these men, in their attempts to arrive at the truth, had no recourse but to resort to playing devil's advocate. As a matter of fact, he was the brightest Dominican in the Philippines uh, during that time, and a very good psychologist and philosopher. And of course, he was also good in theology. But I don't think that he was uh, an authority to pass judgment on these supernatural matters. He recalls having once observed Father Blas questioning a blind girl who was reported to have had mystical experiences and disagreed as to the effectivity of the psychologist's manner of questioning. And my impression was this. In order to pass judgment on the mystical phenomena that are reported about that girl, we had to examine her slowly and carefully and repeatedly and to gain her confidence so that she may speak sincerely and openly. Perhaps Father Blas may have been a little rough about this matter, about this approach. Yet despite the manner in which Father Blas may have conducted his investigation, Bishop Pedernal recounts that the psychologist had been impressed with Teresita. This is what I heard from him, that uh, uh, to his surprise, his intellectual, her intellectual capacity, educational attainment, uh, seems will not uh, be sufficient to be able to answer his, his questions as, as a uh, professional uh, psych psychologist, no? But uh, to his surprise, that he could answer very calmly and uh, correctly. Bishop Pedernal's statement is supported by a publication that later reported that Father Blas affirmed Teresing's sanity and stability. If Father Blas did submit a report stating that the novice Teresita Castillo was sane and not given to imagination and hysteria, what then are we to make of her testimony on the appearance of Mary Mediatrix of All Grace? On what grounds did the investigative committee refute the supernatural character of the events of Lipa? of the interrogations at UST, the so-called supernatural manifestations surrounding Teresing reoccurred. Sister Stephanie, who had previously witnessed other phenomena, was not surprised. Nung isang hapon, di, during meditation, nasa UST kami, eh, eh, nakita ko ang easy. Nakahiga pero guma, gumangon, lumakad ganyan, pa ganyan, ganyan sa paikit-ikit sa kama. Nandoon siya, nandito ako, nandito altar namin yung iron chair, nandiyan biglang-biglang. Para ba yung hinawakan ba't hinyakpas mo sa floor? Ang unggong nagulat ako kung ano makita ko yun. Kasi sa bakit, hindi makita ko siya, maputlang-maputlang, mantakbo agad ako. Hindi eh, hindi pa kaganoon eh, ano na eh. Ngayon, hinawakan ko at hihiga ko sa kama sa sir. Bakit? Pan, eh, whenever I meditate on our blessed begin, he appears that big, big black man. Sabi ko, eh, siguro na nabunggo yung chair. She saw further evidence of what Teresine claimed was diabolical harassment. Yung isang umaga, nag-ano kami, nagsimba. Pagdating namin sa room, Nagalisin ng habit, yun laang parang gown niya at saka yung petticoat. Ayun niya. Sabi, sister, punta lang ko sa toilet. Sabi ko, o, oh, hindi, sa, sa karkula ko, hindi pa nakakarating sa loob na loob ng toilet. Lumabas agad, nakatumindig sa pinto. Sabi, sister, sabi mo, ay makita, tinuro sa akin yung tali ng petticoat niya. Naglilingas, yung dalawang lulot. Ako, hindi ginan niya ako agad. Tapos, inipong ko yung abo. Nga, dapat ikot-ikot daw yung devil, yung big black man na yun. Nahawakan yung nakalawit na string ng petticoat. 
It was also at UST that Terracing saw Mother Cecilia once more. Monsignor Santos, who visited Terracing in between her harrowing interrogations, comforted and even fed her when she was too tense to eat, asked if she would like to see the prioress again. I said, I'm not going to be I don't He offered. I don't And so Bishop Santos said, Oh, Mother, and dito ho si Sister Teresita. Uh, ayan, tinanong ko sa kanya if he, if he wants to see you. And, uh -oh. So, ito, ito siya. Ganya. The I kissed her. Walang response. So, Mother, I said, I am here. <laughs> Maybe she got a shock or what I do that. Mother, I said, nandito na ako po. Sabi kong ganun. Kaya nang mag-uusap tayong dalawa, I was telling her that way. Walang response. So, Cardinal Santos left us. Sabi niya, baka, baka si Mother kaya ganun because he is present. So, he left us and he told us, I'll give you half an hour, 30 minutes to, to chat. So, I sat beside her and then I, I embraced her. No response. So, Mother, I said, Naku naman. <laughs> this is good na nga. I'm very happy that I saw you. You pala, you are pala in, in, here in UST. Wala rin response. Then, finally, I said, Ala, alis na lang ako. I go na lang. I said, because you might be tense because I'm here. Anyway, I cannot talk to you. You don't like to talk to me. So, I will, I will go na lang. I told Mother Cecilia that. Now, if during your during our time when I was there during your being prioress, mother, I said, if I had given you uh, headaches or if I had done something wrong, I, ngayon, I'm asking you pardon and forgiveness. I said, so I will go now. And when I said that, then she started to cry. And she embraced me tightly and she started to cry. I said, Sige, iyak na kayo. It's better if you cry. I said, it's always better. Okay. And then, she told me, you know, you, have, you tell the sisters that to pray very, very much for me. Because, hirap na hirap na hirap na ako. Sabi niya, you know, I am not even allowed to join the community acts office, anything. I'm always, I was, she was always there in the infirmary. But I said, oh, mother, why, why did you not ask them if you can, if you can join? No, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. Teresita, sabi niya, that is what, you have to pray very much for me and tell the sisters to pray very, very much for me. So, yes, mother, I said. No, I only want to tell you one thing, she said. Uh, if you still consider me as your mother prioress, I forbid you to use any instrument of penance that you used to ask from me. Because you have to preserve your health because of Mama Mary's case. That is not only our cause, but it is purely on Mama Mary's cause. Dumating na si Monsignor Santos. And she saw both of us were crying. Oh, sige, mother, I will take Sister Teresita uh, to her room. So I kissed her, no? and then I knelt, and she, yung the mga prioress, it's at night time, you know, ganyan, ganyan ako. And then I right, mother, we will be very, very united with our prayers, sacrifices, and everything, I said. 
The next day, Teresing was scheduled to return to Lipa and asked Monsignor Santos if she could say goodbye to Mother Cecilia. But she was told that the prioress was no longer there. She had already been taken to the airport. Sister Bernadette Bautista, one time official chronicler of the Lipa community, shed some light on what may have transpired in UST. The former infirmarian, Mother Mary Ann Kuna, had been banished to Lawag and suffered the same fate as Mother Cecilia. Mother Mary Ann told me that she was brought to UST and there she met Mother Mary Cecilia. And, there, and they were questioned by Father Blas about the, about the event of, uh, of Lipa. And according to her, they were accused by a former sister in Lipa. I think a novice, but she didn't mention me the name. Mother Cecilia would continue to suffer from the ignominy of her banishment from Lipa. I could sense and I could feel within myself that she is suffering interiorly. Sister Bernadette Castillo's testimony and that of the other members of the Carmelite convent in Haro, Iloilo, substantiates Teresing's account of Mother Cecilia's anguish. When she came here to Haro Carmel, she, she was still not so, not, not so thin. But after, a while, after, after some time, she became really very thin and almost emaciated. Because she, she eats very, very little. And she, she was not coming along with us during community acts. After, after our meals, she goes out. And then afterwards, she, she just uh, retires to her room in the infirmary. Beside being barred from the recitation of the divine office and participation in community acts, there were reports that the prioress was reduced to the status of that of a scullery maid at Haro Carmel. I knew her before I entered Carmel. She was a person so, so alive, full of life, and always joyful. Mm -hmm. But when she came here, there was no more life in her. And yet, despite these rather severe deprivations and her apparent distress, the Carmelite nuns would remember that Mother Cecilia never showed any signs of bitterness or anger. Our interviews with the Carmelite community of Haro revealed that they too were witness to strange and unexpected events. Sister Mary Tayamora, the first Filipina to enter Carmel and now 82 years old, keenly remembers that period in their community life. Too shy to appear on camera, she nevertheless testified that on many an early morning, she would see Mother Cecilia in the kitchen burning little pieces of paper. And one afternoon, she and some other nuns were present when a shower of petals fell within the confines of the infirmary. The sisters had excitedly gathered up the petals but the former prioress maintained her composure and when pressed for a reaction, quietly said, I feel so happy because our Blessed Mother is still following me. Apart from what looked like a deliberate dispersal of the main witnesses and advocates of Lipa, and the intimidation and coercion reportedly used by the interrogators on the visionary and the other nuns, there are indications that the official church investigation was a rather hurried, slipshod affair, generally wanting in thoroughness. Bishop Versosa, for instance, was never questioned, and, more importantly, neither was Bishop Oviar, who would, till his dying day, wait for official church representatives to come for his testimony. Francisco de Chanco, 
head of the Lipa Marian Research Center, which at one time spearheaded a campaign that tried to have the case reopened, cites yet another serious oversight on the part of the commission. For example, from Mrs. Mendoza of, of Paco, and also from Sister Melania Sunga of Candon uh, Ilocosur. And I asked them if they were investigated, those medicals were investigated, and they said never. So I presume that, that those who investigated DIPA only asked questions from the sisters and never investigated any of the medicals. On April 6, 1951, only two and a half years after the reported apparitions, the Philippine hierarchy pronounced its verdict. There was no supernatural intervention in the events that occurred at Carmel of Lipa. The decision was signed by six bishops, Gabriel M. Reyes, then Archbishop of Manila, Cesar M. Guerrero, Bishop of San Fernando, Mariano Madriaga, Bishop of Lingayen, Juan C. Season, Auxiliary Bishop of Nueva Segovia, Vicente P. Reyes, Auxiliary Bishop of Manila, and surprisingly, Rufino Santos, Apostolic Administrator of Lipa. All of these bishops have since passed away but there are testimonies to the effect that they may have been ill-prepared to sign such a document. You ever get to talk to any of them or were they? Yes, ah, only one because at that time, 1982, only one was uh, living and that was Bishop, uh, Bishop Reyes of Cabanatuan, Vicente Reyes. And I asked him, how did you arrive to that decision? He told me, I was a young bishop then. I was called to the Arcebispado in Intramuros at nine o'clock in the morning. We had that conference there. At around three o'clock, we signed the documents that it was not true. I asked him, uh, did you investigate yourself, Your Excellency? No, he said. There, there was a body, a commission, who investigated. Terracing states that she was never called to face or be interrogated by the bishops. Neither was she ever interrogated by the Carmelite fathers sent from Rome. Dichanko discloses that there are also some indications of coercion. At least one bishop there was, uh, was uh, confessed that he, they were, he was forced to sign. Mother Mary Margaret of the Sacred Heart, prioress of Angeles Carmel, reveals that Bishop Guerrero often expressed his disappointment over the turn of events. He did not make much statement about it because it was a forbidden by the church. But then we knew from his uh, talks from that, uh, but privately, that he was in a, in a uh, I mean, he approved that uh, happening in Lipa. Uh, he find it supernatural. Bishop Cesar Guerrero used to come here every year on the 21st of November. He used to come here to, to pay his, uh, his respect to our Blessed Mother. And he says Mass. After he saying Mass, he used to see the community. I was then a very young novice. And I remember in one of his visits, he said that, uh, you know, I am really waiting for, for the approval of Our Lady. I really believe but I was forced to sign the document against Our Lady. He was crying when he told us that. Not really crying, but I saw tears in his eyes. Jesuit priest Father Lorenzo Maria Guerrero, who headed the Apostleship of Prayer for 29 years, and then went on to head the Marian movement of priests in the Philippines, disclosed that his uncle, Bishop Cesar Guerrero, revealed as he lay dying that he had been forced into signing the final verdict on Lipa. Moreover, Bishop Guerrero stated that he believed in the veracity of the apparitions. Father Guerrero has since suffered a debilitating stroke, but in his desire to set the record straight, has signed his official testimony to this effect. Father Guerrero, is this your signature? Yes, yes. Do you attest to the authenticity and veracity of this account? Yes, very much. To the best of your knowledge, was this your uncle's deathbed confession? Yes. And Bishop Guerrero was already in the species de San Jose because he was living there, no? And once in a while, Bishop of Yar, we go there to visit him. 
And he always talk about the, 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 the petal. The same thing with the late Archbishop. All the other one who signed is Archbishop one season of began. It's the same thing with season. All this, all these bishops have signed. They never did away with the petal that they got. The sisters gave them. Mother Therese recounts that Bishop Guerrero made a rather enigmatic revelation. I was transferred in 1956 to Angeles Carmel as superioress. Now, every now and then, he became the bishop of San Fernando. He used to visit us. And one day when he was talking to us, we were talking about Lipa, and he said, I always go there every November 21. Someday the truth will come. He said that. Did he ever indicate that he believed that it would be, I know? Not exactly, but uh, as he was explaining what happened, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell it. But Sige na. Sabi niya, it's the fourth of that month. But he did not mention it. I don't know, he did not tell the name. A reliable source testifies that Bishop Patrick Shanley of Isabella was reportedly so disgusted by the conduct of the investigation and the manner in which certain church officials influenced the outcome of the verdict. In a fit of anger, he denounced the proceedings and revealed that the bishops had been forced to sign the verdict by the papal nuncio upon the pain of excommunication. What kind of a man was Monsignor Vagnosi? Well, he was a handsome man in um, uh, strong will. He was a very intelligent person, was very well prepared. He was a workaholic, took very little time off for vacation and relaxation. Uh, he also was uh, rather intolerant sometimes of mistakes. He always wanted results, and in the process sometimes became a little rough. He became one of the, uh, um, one of the I mean, most influential uh, cardinals we ever had. He's very impulsive, you know. That's why he, he had many friends here in the Philippines, but he also had so many enemies, I would say. Bishop Pedernal adds that Bagnosi did not believe the reported apparitions at Lipa to be authentic. And he said that uh, it was a kind of uh, 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 a co in the Spanish, they say, uh, but invento, no? Mm -hmm. Invention of the sisters. If he had indeed threatened the Philippine hierarchy with excommunication, as some testimonies indicate, did Vagnosi overstep the bounds of his authority? For a papal legate functions as an ambassador. His duties are normally that of liaison between the Vatican and the Philippine government and hierarchy. I don't show us now. When it comes to jurisdiction, the notion has no, no jurisdiction so whatsoever to any bishop. It is a, as you may, I, I, I hope you know uh, that the setup of the Catholic Church is that every, every bishop in his diocese is only responsible directly to the Pope. Not to denounce you. A, 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 a bishop of, uh, of, for example, of San Pablo must know uh, it's not responsible to Cardinal Sin, even he's the Archbishop, but it's only to the Holy Father, direct to the Holy Father. I think he shouldn't have interfered with the matter of the petals. That should have been done by the Philippine hierarchy, by the bishops. Is it possible that they would have signed because they were afraid? It is possible, yes. It is possible that a white man in those times had a superiority either real or uh, supposed, over the Filipinos, because you were still so close to the times of colonialism. Bishop Pedernal, however, indicates that the considerable influence of Monsignor Rufino Santos cannot be discounted. Bishop uh, Oviar. Oviar. Yeah, a good friend of Bishop Guerrero. Yes. And he said, oh, why did you sign that? Uh, why did you I know that you you, are, you believe it. You always have your petal there in your... I said, 
in this late career, sir, but you know, I have to sign because, you know, the cardinal said we, we, we all have to sign. <laughs> But yes. I want to make known one thing. Yes. It was not Bagnosi who decided the whole thing. The definitive generalist of the Carmelite order was the one who investigated the whole thing. He stayed in Manila for I think next month, a month or two months. And it was in the Lipa Monastery every day. And he used to go to the Lunchitur and make his uh, progressive report. And on the progressive report, the thing they were making is progressive report to Rome. Mm -hmm. See, it was Father Michael, I think his name was Father Michael, who did all the investigation. So it was Father Michael whose decision was the overall factor, the, the main factor that, did, that uh, made him this decision. Mm -hmm. It was not Bagnos. We discovered that there were documents on Lipa still in existence in the archives of the Carmelite Generalate in Rome. Armed with a letter from Archbishop Gaviola, we went to Rome with the hopes that these documents would be able to shed some light on the manner of the investigation and the reason for the verdict. Strangely enough, there was very little on file on the case of Lipa. There weren't any records of who had been sent, why and for how long. More importantly, there wasn't even an official report from Father Michael Moylan on the nature of his investigation or the reason for the negative decision on Lipa. This was, it was too, too prima, I would say not to say premature, but too, very too soon, you know. Apparently, many members of the church hierarchy believed in the apparitions of Mary at Lipa, but had unfortunately kept their silence. Bishop Pedernal relates the very interesting account of Monsignor Morelli, chargé d'affaires of the Holy See, prior to Monsignor Bagnosi. Pedernal had accompanied Bishop Oviar on his visit to Rome and had been present at the meeting between Morelli and Oviar. Morelli started about this case of Lipa. He said, Bishop Oviar, why did the bishops in the Philippines, why did they not insist in asking the Holy Father to approve that the Virgin Mother, Blessed Mother, have gone to the Philippines, to Lipa? Because uh, I myself personally, before I left the Philippines, twice I experienced in Lipa what had happened in Fatima about the sunlight while I'm there in Carmel. And Bishop of Biar, you know, ordinarily I said, Luabasa ang kanyang pagkabatang. He said, speaking, they were talking in Spanish, he said, Tonteria, he said, how, how, how is this possible? You were the one of those who signed that this thing about the patterns and about that is foolishness in the poor always say senior you know at that time i'm not a bishop but he, he was insisting that i'm only a retired one senior in fact bishop of yesterday said you are here at the at the point of the nose of the holy father so you tell the holy father you you approve that the blessed mother went to the philippines there in lipa he said, what can I, I cannot do that, I, I have, I'm nothing here, I'm only praying as an old retired monsignor, canon, canonigo. But I say, you bishops in the Philippines, you have more influence and power to tell the Holy Father, please, declare that the Blessed Mother can. And so the bishop, uh, uh, afterwards he was explaining, saying, oh, you say that. When you were there, you said uh, you signed that document, that there was nothing, now he would you telling me now that you believe that the Blessed Mother went there, no? And so I was joking, Bishop of Yara say, Tama na ho, wag na ninyong kagalitad, baka tayo hindi pa kanin. Huh? So during the lunch, and, uh, before we left, again, Monsignor Morelli, he pulled out from his pocket. Monsignor, this petal, which I got from Lipa during the shower, will not be, I will never separate from this petal until I die. After the church decision was released, the nuns were instructed 
to destroy all materials connected with the apparitions. I think this is what it was one week that we were burning and burning. Sinunog yung diary ko eh, pati diary ni Mother Cecilia. Sinunog nila lahat. Leaflets, uh, books, uh, novenas, everything. They were piles and piles and boxes and boxes. You had to burn all of that. We began burning then after about a week or less than a week, Mother Jacinta got sick. And after that, the whole community helped in crumpling the, the paper first. It extended to about a month in all. We as exorcists, we had to burn our own pictures at saka yung petals. You burn? What did you burn, sister? Petals and pictures. Oh, I see. What about letters? Did you ever have a lot of letters? A lot. So you burned a lot of petals? Not a lot, but a good number. Mm -hmm. At saka yung pictures niya. Oh, what, these were the pictures of the statue? Oh, of our blessed mother. Even the convent at Haro Iloilo was inspired. Unfortunately, a young nun had excitedly showed her precious petal to one of the Carmelite investigators sent by the Generalate in Rome. And soon afterwards, Sister Mary Tayamora was ordered to burn all petals and material connected with the apparitions at Lipa. She states that as she did so, a gigantic blue flame issued from the small pyre, expanded to the height of four feet, and lingered until everything was consumed. The statue of the Mediatrix was also ordered destroyed, but the nuns couldn't bring themselves to do so and devised ways and means to save it. The statue, we did not burn it. It was uh, kept. Where and then it? it was in, in a corner and then it was um, covered with um, cloth. But they put a hat center to make it look like an apple tart and they painted it blue. There was a time and then it was exposed in the in one of the rooms and then afterwards I think huh when Monsignor Santos or somebody else came and said do not do that so it was kept again. Strict silence was imposed on the sisters of Carmel. They were never to speak of the apparitions again. To reinforce this order they were told that if they spoke about it amongst themselves, they would be guilty of a venial sin. And discussing it with outsiders would constitute a mortal sin and possible excommunication. As shocking as this may seem to us now, one has to remember that this occurred in pre-Vatican II times. Much has changed since then. In fact, the, our superior from Rome came to us and told about it, not to speak about it anymore. Even Monsignor Reyes, the one who died, he told us, he brought us to the, to the choir and then summoned us and said, it is, uh, not, it is forbidden to speak about that lady of Lipa. So we kept quiet about it. By declaring an absence of supernatural intervention in the events at Lipa, the church had, in effect, implied that the entire affair was a hoax and thus brought down upon Carmel a deluge of public detraction. But among the thousands of devotees, there was shock, pain, disbelief and anger. I don't believe in that. I remember being very deeply hurt by all this talk. I could not. I cannot accept that it is not true. Santos. <laughs> Alam niyo ang hinihingi ko lang kay Mediatrix? Huwag lang huwag ng shower. Papagyuhin mo ng petal to sa obispo nga yung maniwala. I uh, sort of felt offended when I heard the news that uh, this was a hoax. Masakit. Masakit sa amin talaga. Because my faith is strong that that happening is true. Ari, yung alam namin totoo ay silang maniwala kaya masakit sa amin. Even if the people will not believe, I believe. The first thing I told Mama Mary, please let me forget. No? Just please let me forget all these things, especially when I was out already. And just please let, let me forget mm, because I respect what the church declares.
From the beginning, Carmel had its share of detractors, and with the release of the church's official pronouncement, skeptics had a heyday. The general rumor spreading at the time was that the nuns at Carmel were unscrupulous opportunists, conspiring and inventing stories of apparitions to make money for a new chapel. There was all this ugly talk. Can you believe na itong mga madring ito ay yapak? Tumutulog ay walang unang kundi kahoy, nagpapakahirap. Itong mga, itong mga madring ito ay magdadaya. Sasabihin, yung mga flowers na yun yung galing sa itaas, kung man na sila nag-aano, ay makakapaniwala ba naman ng ganun? I could not in my heart accept the fact that, you know, that a hoax could be perpetuated by holy nuns, particularly Carmelite nuns, you know, who are known for their faith. Hindi napakalaking kasalanan, kaya kami lahat dito eh, para magpakabanal eh, kung gagawa nun, eh di mas malaking kasalanan namin. The sister never had uh, an intention of building their chapel. I would say that as religious, I think, uh, impersonally, I cannot believe that they just want to deceive, just to build a, a church in their convent, and they will, they will deceive people like that. You know? There was talk of a blower hidden within the convent, which the nuns purportedly used to create the famous petal showers. Sister Bernadette relates that Mother Marianne Kuna suffered especially from this talk. She had difficulty in the world because... Uh, I think they were not believing. They thought that she was the mastermind of all those blowers. Because she's a character. She's stronger than Mother Mary Cecilia. So the blame was being put on her. I was told that uh, the sisters use a blower to blow the petals. But I could not believe it. Being a technical uh, engineer, I know the effect of a blower. <clears throat> One, it makes a lot of noise. So those people there, they will uh, notice the noise and then inquire why. Second, when you blow something, it goes in a, a uh, curve direction due to force of gravity. But in this case, the petals just happened about 10 feet high and fell directly below. And besides, a big blower cannot uh, reach probably 50 feet. And what happened with Mrs. Kason was about 70 feet away. How can it reach? So I could not believe. I can testify. We have no blower. For some they were cleaning the whole. We had only that <laughs> that whole cloister, no. And I used to work in the basement. I didn't see any blower. And did you have electricity in your cells? No. In 1948, did you have electricity in your rooms? When I entered, there was none. There was no electricity. None. None. Uh, so did you happen to have electric fans? None. Okay. <laughs> So you had no electric no. fans. Therefore, the theory that there was a blower. Uh, I do not even know what is a blower. <laughs> yung, because in the, the province, is it not we blow like that? Akala ko yun yung blower, yung pala eh, ganun eh, malaki daw yun. Retired General Godofredo Juliano, then the commandant of Lipa Air Force Base, attests that the petals could not have been thrown out of an airplane or helicopter, as he would have been aware of the air traffic in the area. He too had witnessed one of the famed petal showers. But I was not able to see anybody. I, in fact, went also a little beyond back of the side of the chapel to see if the, any of the windows were open. All the windows were closed. I could not determine the source from where they came from or how they uh, started falling on the courtyard. Guillermo Milan, then 35, who had fallen away from the church, did more than look.
Convinced that the nuns were playing tricks, he clambered up a tree, positioning himself with a brownie camera next to what he saw was the only open window of the convent's second floor. And a little later, people began to cry, shower, shower, necks craning up as a fragrance filled the air. Bakit ito? Ang mga tao ay nagtingala. Wala nakakakita. Ako ho nakakita. Mismo isang petal na above the diro. Pa, paano mong gagali sa bintana? Nakumbisi ako ngayon. Hindi sa bintana nang gagali. Climbing up to the roof, he was amazed to discover not one, but several freshly plucked petals arranged in the form of a rose. Makakitita ka. Wala namang maglalagay o maghuhulog sa pwet ako'y nakaabang. He hurriedly scooped them up put them in his pocket and fought off the pilgrims anxiously grabbing at him for a petal. Upon arriving home and in the presence of two reporters, he discovered that the petals he had so zealously hoarded had disappeared from his pocket and only one remained. And so began a change of heart. He ceased his nightly drinking bouts and started to help the nuns distribute the water. Witnesses were also at a loss to explain how the petal's vertical trajectory could be maintained despite strong winds blowing across the courtyard. The images found on the petals also mystified many. Detractors, however, said that the nuns had impressed images onto the petals before throwing or blowing them down. The person who told me about all this was a member of the commission, a scientist, Dr. Kisumbing at the time. He was director of the Bureau of Science. And he told me about how all this whole thing was a hoax, it was fake that some unseen hand or hands had, you know, imprinted this outline of the Virgin on each of the petals with painstaking patience, I imagine. Dr. Kisumbing's declaration that these petals were earthly and not heavenly ones elicited comment from some newspaper columnists who questioned his expertise by asking if he had ever had occasion to examine any petals that had originated from heaven. Despite what seems to be a lack of hard evidence or logical basis, the hoax theory has remained remarkably resilient over the years. And today, the dominant impression many have of Lipa is that of the nuns and their infamous blower. To this day, a number of journalists continue to propagate this theory without, it seems, any effort to check out the facts, irresponsibly repeating or culling from previously published misinformed reports. Without benefit of a thorough investigation, rumor was printed then, published as fact. And it is an outrage that no one ever thought to inquire if, in 1948, in an area laid waste by the devastation of World War II, the Discal said Carmelites, sworn to poverty, had the electricity or space required to operate a gigantic machine capable of blowing rose petals across a courtyard and several hundred meters into the sky. The Lady Wand of Persecution, and eerily enough, all those associated with Carmel were vilified and made to suffer. Stringent sanctions were imposed upon the community at Lipa. Yeah, our vows were, uh, I mean, were delayed. We could not, uh, we could not make our perpetual vows. 
Several of us were scheduled already, but we could not make it because everything has been cancelled. It took years. It seems... 90, it, it, I don't remember, but it seems 1953, only something like that, mm -hmm. or 54. Yeah. And also the simple professions of the sisters and the clothing of the sisters were delayed. Mm -hmm. And then, aside from that, the, we could not receive aspirants. The files of the correspondence between the new prioress and the diocesan administrator bears this out. And not only were the doors of Lipa Carmel ordered closed to applicants for the religious life, but also, despite repeated pleas, to hired help and any outside assistance. It is also curious that in several chancery records documenting the history of the Diocese of Lipa, all evidence of the existence of the Carmel community has disappeared, and it is not even listed among the religious congregations residing in the area. The nuns were constantly berated by priests who came to Carmel to lecture and scold them for their alleged misdeeds. I remember one of them uh, when he came and then we served him, no? But that was already after that. He said, oh, you see, you have plenty of things to serve because you, made really, you really made money and you bought all this with that money that you fooled the people. It was humiliating because to be told that uh, you are the dishonor of the order or, or pictures like that. For a long time, Sister Elizabeth single-handedly supported the entire community through begging and was solely responsible for all of Carmel's external needs. She recalls that it was a very painful time for she would be sneered and laughed at as she went about her duties in the outside world. I had to run here and run there, go to the town and then Tara Singh subsequently left Carmel in 1951. She had been asked to do so, purportedly because she had not completed the residency required of a novice due to her frequent sessions with a commission at UST. However, instead of sending her away, Mamer, one of the foundresses of Lipa Carmel, instructed her to leave of her own volition as this would enable her to return. Hindi ako nakatulog. Yak ako nang iyak sa, sa, uh, sa convent. No? And then I left. I went to my parents. After two weeks, she thought of paying a courtesy visit to the papal nuncio, Monsignor Bagnozzi. So I went up and I was made to wait for half an hour there. Then when he came out of the door to see me, I stood up and I was going to kiss the ring, he did not want to give the, his hand, no. And then I said, um, you, you, I know, your reverence, I said, I just came here to let you know that I, I left Carmel for treatment, no. And she, he drove me away, he said, you little devil, he, he told me, you better get out of my place, he said that. Then I knelt again, and you know, I said, please give me your blessing. He did not give me my blessing. He did not give me any blessing at all. So, then I heard that he shouted at me, and nearly pushed me out of the door. Huh? Because, hindi lang balik. All for Mama Mary na lang. And my intention was very good. Parang, just out of courtesy, no? Just to let him know that I was out. So, then when I went home, I was crying. She told Cardinal Santos about it, and in the light of his denial of the authenticity of the events, his alleged reply gives one pause. Sabi niya talagang totoo yata yung sinabi ng mahalabiran that you will be suffering up to the end of your life. The same might well have been said for the main witnesses of the events at Lipa. And yet, despite the deep tragedy that marked their lives, in utter obedience, they never made any official statements, only confiding to very close friends their belief in the apparitions at Lipa. However, those who had given the orders have passed away, and the rule of silence no longer applies. Nonetheless, we sought and secured 
Archbishop Gaviola's approval for the interview with the Carmelites of Lipa. Bishop Versosa stayed on in the old Palacio at Lipa until the end of his term, then joined Monsignor Oviar for a time in Lucena before returning to his hometown in Vigan to die. Sister Bernadette recounts that Mother Marianne Kuna remembered the day the bishop came to say goodbye to the community at Carmel before leaving for Vigan. He could not tell them that he was leaving, but she told me that he was crying and the only thing that he said was in patria, in heaven. Monsignor Gregorio Salvatus, Versosa's secretary in Vigan for 27 months, described the aging bishop as a broken man. A sickly old man, nervous, he was depressed, but he never complained. To his dying day, the bishop was said to have treasured a replica of the statue of the Mediatrix of All Grace. This one he told me that he didn't like to dispose of the image of the Virgin in his baptistry. It just remained there. Bishop Pedernal opines that Monsignor Oviar was also thought to have been party to the nun's alleged scheme. And this was perhaps the reason for his removal as auxiliary bishop of Lipa. And more importantly, what kept him for so many years from his position. It had puzzled much the hierarchy because the hierarchy is very much aware of the good things and everything, his holiness of life and the activities in the, the, the growth of, in, in the diocese, you know. I remember one year, or not even less than one year before he became ordinary, the late Archbishop, uh, Archbishop uh, Lino Gonzaga. You know? He was then the president of the Bishop's Conference. I was already Bishop. And the one time he, he cornered me there in Baguio. He said, what do you know about this? Why is Bishop of Biar until now, after three petitions of the whole hierarchy of the Philippines, asking the Holy Father to appoint him as Bishop of Lucena, not just as apostolic administrator? Can you tell me something, enlighten me, why? So he said, you tell me. If Cardinal is the one that is blocking, are you willing to come with me to Rome, personally to the Holy Father? Are you ready to tell the Holy Father everything you know about this, what happened, why? Yes, I said, I'm willing to go. But you know, after that talk of us, after one week, it came out the appointment as ordinary of the same. <laughs> He was always uh, telling me that he is fully convinced that there, is, there was an apparition. Well, uh, he was uh, that's genuine. <laughs> that really, the was really miraculous the way he shower of petals. Uh -huh. The only thing that he lamented was that uh, the shower of petal was for a very uh, immediate was being commercialized, and there were fake petals that were being distributed. He hoped that it would be reopened. It is curious that Oviar was later to found a religious order which he named the Missionary Catechists of St. Therese. Therese of Lisieux, or the Carmelite nun called Therese of the Child Jesus, is also popularly known as the Little Flower, and is the saint for whom Teresita Castilla was named, for her mother had made a novena to this saint in the hopes of begetting another daughter. Teresine claims that the little flower had at times accompanied the Virgin in her visits to Carmel and had even greeted the novice on her feast day. This saint is commonly associated with roses. In fact, the church beside the generalate in Rome of the Carmelite Fathers contains an effigy of the body of Saint Therese and in the glass case is a copy of her writings and above it the words, From the heavens I will let fall a shower of roses. The headquarters of the Missionary Catechist of St. Therese in Quezon Province includes a museum and shrine erected in the memory of Bishop Oviar and his loving testimony of how highly he was regarded by his priests, parishioners and missionaries. It is said that favors have been granted and miraculous healings occurred to those who have asked his intercession or prayed at his tomb. At present there is a movement underway that seeks to present his case to the causes of saints.
Mother Cecilia stayed at Harrow for 13 years and was brought back to Lipa only on March 14, 1963. She spoke very rarely on the apparitions. But one of the nuns report that she had indicated that when she died, everything would come to light. According to Mother Amy, who was prioress at the time of her death, Mother Cecilia must have had a premonition of this, for she asked permission to go, in other words, to die, in order to hasten the vindication of Mary, mediatrix of all grace. Shortly afterwards, on December 13, 1982, she fell from the stairs. It was the staircase of the novices. We were farther in the recreation of the community. And they heard a big noise, and it was Mother Mary Cecilia. She was lying down on the floor. She struck her head on the window sill, then from the window sill to the cement floor. And she was bleeding very much. But she was still conscious. When, the when we, when we, when we, uh, when we brought her up, uh, she was still talking. So I think she said only, "It's painful." Like that. Mm -hmm. And then she was brought to the infirmary, and we called for the priest for the last anointment, anointing. And then she was brought to the hospital. But she was already unconscious when she was brought to the hospital. And that evening she died. A week before her death, however, Mother Cecilia telephoned Teresing, requesting her to come to Lipa as she had something very important to say. But Teresing was bedridden with fever and asked what it was as she could not come immediately. You know, do you know that Mama Mary is so beautiful? No. Mother, sabi ko, <laughs> how did you see? Did you see her? I was in the telephone. No. Naku, hindi ba na naman ang istorya? Ganun eh, nakakabigla ba siya? Tara Singh had suspected that Mother Cecilia had seen the Virgin and on one other occasion had questioned the prioress about this, mentioning that a younger Vietnamese sister had caught her in the hermitage conversing and laughing before the image. I was telling her, oh, Siguro talaga, you, you, you are seeing mother, Mama Mary. And I, I'll, be, I'll be very happy. I'll be very, very happy. Sabi ko ganoon. Change na naman ang, change na naman ang conversation. Sister Bernadette recalls an equally intriguing conversation she had with the prioress. This conversation had taken place in front of the statue of the mediatrix. She said that... Uh, this is statue, she, she's already 18, oh, she looks 18, and this is statue, she looks 18, but in reality, she looks only 15 years old. Sister Bernadette regrets that she did not pursue this conversation, for it had certainly occurred to her at the time that the prioress must have seen the virgin to have said such a thing. On still another occasion, Sister Bernadette heard that the virgin had consulted Mother Cecilia on the position of the statue's arms. I ask her, is it true, Mother, that you were the one who told Our Lady that you would prepare her to be with extended hands than on her breast? On her. She said, yes, because she looks more motherly with that position. These enigmatic last remarks of the prioress is one of many signs that the story of Lipa has not yet ended. For even way back in the 1950s, circumstances seemed to prepare the way, as it were, for the reinvestigation of Lipa at some future, more hospitable time. Teresing, for one, was prevented by her deteriorating health from returning to Carmel, where access to her testimony would have been difficult. Some of the nuns who were vital witnesses likewise left Carmel for a variety of reasons, a circumstance which enabled them to speak freely on the events either as lay persons or as members of other congregations, foregoing the need of obtaining permission from the Bishop of Lipa. Sister Stephanie, for instance, left Carmel in 1952 and could not re-enter because of her failing health. She subsequently married a Lipa convert, Guillermo Milan. Mother Therese of the Holy Face left in 1966 to found her own congregation. Sister Clotilde, then known as Monica of the Savior, 
left Carmel because she was diagnosed as tubercular, but upon subsequent examination at the Quezon Institute was found to be completely healthy. But perhaps even more intriguing is that Mother Cecilia, aside from affirming the authenticity of the apparitions, apparently also believed that the Virgin would return to Carmel. Two weeks before her death, she spoke again to Sister Bernadette. She told me that uh, the year is ending and Our Lady is not yet here because she's always expecting that Our Lady is coming back. Testimonies as to Mother Cecilia's character also make it difficult to associate such a woman with deception, especially on a large scale as would have been necessary for a phenomenon like Lipa. Mother Cecilia was known for her virtue and her gentle, motherly care, and was very much loved by all those who came in contact with her. I don't think she was telling the, any lie up to us. Yes, I trust there. Why did you trust Mother? I know she is good. She is a holy, she is a holy woman. The first papal nuncio of the Philippines, Monsignor Egidio Bagnozzi, fellow arch-conservative and friend of Cardinal Ottaviani, went on in 1958 to become apostolic delegate in Washington, after which he was recalled and made cardinal in 1967 and appointed president of the Prefecture of the Economic Affairs of the Holy See. We quote from his short biography in the book, The Inner Elite. This was a big disappointment to him. Earlier he had thought himself in line for the papacy and he had counted at least in getting a major post in the Curia. What he ended up with was a sinecure, the title and salary, without effective control of the operations of this major Vatican financial institution. Monsignor Rufino J. Santos, initially apostolic administrator, then Archbishop of Lipa, went on to become Archbishop of Manila and the first Filipino Cardinal. Failing health, specifically a serious heart condition, prevented Teresita Castillo from returning to Carmel. In her own words, she cried and cried for over two years. Her separation from the religious life caused her such deep grief that in an effort to lift her spirits, her parents persuaded her to go on a European tour which was led by Monsignor Santos. Eight priests also comprised a part of the tour group, among them Monsignor Casas, who had also been a part of the investigative commission. One cannot help but wonder, why were these officials of the church not more circumspect or wary about being seen with Teresita Castillo? After all, she had been labeled a fraud, a crackpot, or judged by some to have been the victim of an overactive imagination that had duped an entire nation. In fact, Monsignor Santos continued for some time to function somewhat as her spiritual director and had become a family friend spending a few vacations at their farm and at times saying mass at their home. Up until the last few years of his life, Teresing would visit him at the Cardinal's villa at least once a month for confession or an occasional dinner. It was only a little over a year ago that she discovered his role in the sentence on Lipa. Upon his recommendation, she began to work with Father Leo English at the Redemptorist Church in Baclaran, assisting in the now very popular English Tagalog dictionaries, a job she continues to hold to this day. Of course, malicious tongues have commented on what has evolved into a lasting friendship, for Teresing has continued to serve and nurse Father English, whom she affectionately calls Lolo, the Filipino word for grandfather. Sometime in the early 1960s, she was involved in a vehicular accident, which resulted in an injury to the nerve at the base of her brain. This brought on epileptic seizures. However, after two years of medication, the seizures disappeared. She never married, but adopted an infant left on the steps of Baclaran Church. Grace Irene is now a lively, intelligent, 19-year-old college student. Mother and daughter lead a very quiet and unobtrusive life in the suburbs of Manila. In obedience to the church, she has never spoken publicly about the apparitions, nor issued any statements to the press, despite the proliferation of newspaper and magazine articles maligning her and criticizing the events of Lipa.
However, because of the escalating demand to reopen the investigation, and after much prayer and consultation with her spiritual directors, she reluctantly consented to tell her story. Quite understandably, she is nervous about the resurgence of interest in the case. Anne has tried to prepare herself for the controversies that she knows will come. Teresing has to this day had to contend with accusations of insanity and fraud. caused the church's rather hasty pronouncement on the apparitions of Lipa. Premised as it was on questionable grounds and on what seemed to be a rather flawed investigation. Such efforts by the church hierarchy to clamp down on reported supernatural manifestations also characterized other supposed apparitions in other parts of the world. Since 1933, more than 200 other presumed revelations have suffered the same fate. It is curious, though, that there was a series of so-called apparitions that occurred in the late 1940s that somehow seem related to Lipa. We refer to two in particular. Our Lady of All Nations, which began in Amsterdam on March 1945 and lasted for over 14 years, and the Great Mediatrics of Graces, which occurred in 1946 in Marienfried, Pfaffenhofen, Germany. In Marienfried, she requested, as she did in Fatima, and as she was said to have done two years later in Lipa, for the Saturday devotion. And the apparition of Amsterdam was by far one of the most controversial, as it dealt, as did the apparition of the Virgin of the Revelation in Trefontane, Rome, with the incorruptibility of her body, and surprisingly, with a pronouncement regarding the development of a last dogma in Marian history. It is pointed out that though there have been two negative pronouncements on this apparition, the much celebrated statue of the Virgin of Akita, whose locutions and accompanying supernatural events have been recognized by Bishop Ito and upheld by the Japanese Conference of Bishops, was inspired by the painting supposedly requested by the Lady of All Nations. In this apparition, she called on all Christian peoples to band themselves together and asked that the theologians see their battle for the Marian dogma through to the finish, assuring them of her help, revealing that she was being sent by the Lord and Master who wanted to give this world spiritual oneness. I come as co-redemptrix mediatrix at this time. Co-redemptrix I was already at the Annunciation. This means that the mother became co-redemptrix by the will of the father. Tell your theologians this. Tell them, moreover, that this will be the last dogma in Marian history. This picture shall prepare the way. Have this picture brought to the whole world, and thereby I mean the whole world, not only your country. The world is degenerating. The world is being afflicted with disaster upon disaster. The world will be, and is, economically and materially, at a dead end. Wars will continue until the spirit of truth comes in with his help. Get the people back to the cross. Canon René Laurentin, theologian, leading Mariologist and author, explains that especially during the post-war years, the Catholic hierarchy as a whole was simply not predisposed to such mystic phenomena as apparitions of the Virgin Mary or of any other heavenly being. In his report on the church and apparitions, he points out that there was a period of effective repression and that apparitions suffered from the great severity of Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, assessor of the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office. We quote, This rigorous and traditional man was responsible for the matter of private revelation and took harsh action through his decisions and imperative orders to bishops. 
It was through his influence, so it seems, that Bishop Halen, who was favorable to the apparitions of Borang, was removed from the decision process. He was very severe for apparition and uh, charism, special, extraordinary charism. Uh, he put uh, on to different causes of canonization, like uh, Yvonne Aimé de Maletrois or uh, the Polish uh, sister Faustina. Uh, I think during the war it was troubled time. Uh, he was afraid to see tendency to illuminism and uh, illuminism. Yes. And uh, <coughs> for this reason he thought he had to be severe. The ultra conservative Cardinal Ottaviani, also known as the Holy Terror of the Holy Office or Big Brother in a cassock was described as probably being the most feared man in the Vatican and had often acted as a self-defined policeman of its faith and morals, was retired by Paul VI in 1967. Three years later, the floodgates were open when that same Pope abolished the canon law that forbade any publication about apparitions. According to Laurentan, Ottaviani's successor, Cardinal Sepper, proved to be more open and flexible, and it was in this spirit that he worked out the new criteria for judging the nature of the presumed apparitions and revelations. Laurentan, who was consulted on the criteria, says that this attitude of openness is shared by John Paul II. With uh, our new pope, uh, everything is more open because he has a very good and open religious sensibility to every type of action of God. He wants not to put the action of God in a square, but to see where God is doing something. And it is also my way. Efforts are underway to have the Lipa case reopened for investigation. In July 1982, Francisco Di Chanco, together with Nelly Kison, Cruz Laurel and some others formed the Marian Research Center, which collected testimonies and information relating to the events of 1948. They gathered more than 5,000 signatures from the laity, pressing Lipa Archbishop Mariano Gaviola to have the apparitions of Lipa re-investigated. Well, it is our pastoral duty to listen to the faithful to pay respect to their own feelings. But we have also to safeguard the welfare of the church in general. And that is where the, the problem of making a decision lies quite heavily. There was one thing that was quite also revealing. It was uh, a letter from our then Apostolic Nuncio, the Archbishop Carmine Rojo. This letter was dated something like 1970. And in the letter, what struck me is this, that it just says that with reference to this thing, please uh, know that it has been found that the deported apparitions were uh, real and pious imposture. There, at least there were around four bishops who told me, what for it? What for it? Are there conversions happening? In August of 1989, a small group of Lipa devotees began to get together every Saturday to honor Mary and to pray for the reopening of the investigation into the events of Lipa. Unbeknown to them, they were fulfilling one of the requests she had made in 1948. Forty years of silence were eclipsed in a matter of months, and the first penitential procession in honor of Mary Mediatrix of All Grace was held three months later, and public declaration of the events of 1948 revealed for the first time since the proclamation of the unfavorable verdict. At the end of the ceremonies, testimonies were made on recent cures attributed to the intercession of Mary Mediatrix. Are there phenomenal healings happening?
Luz Palmares related the miraculous healing of her son, Raymond Julius, who suffered from a mitral valve prolapse, enlargement of the heart, and various other vascular illnesses. Aside from that, he had a cleft palate and couldn't speak normally. She began a novena to marry mediatrics of all grace, hung a scapular with a petal around her son's neck, and within a few months, his condition improved so dramatically that the operation recommended by the doctors was no longer necessary. Moreover, Julius soon found that he could speak normally. Uh, I'm uh, Raymond Julius Palmares. How old are you, Raymond? Uh, I'm 20, uh, uh, 22 years old. And what do you do? Uh, I'm a music teacher from uh, St. Bridget's College High School Department. Panginoon, narito ako. In February 1990, a strange phenomenon was reported in the Granha district of Lipa, a few blocks away from Carmel. A luminous white outline of what seemed to be a woman in prayer began to appear in the evenings on one of the leaves of a tall coconut tree. Then 15-year-old R.J. Garcia, a member of the Protestant fundamentalist born-again movement, was reportedly the first to see it. He was convinced that it was the Virgin and has since been receiving instruction in the Catholic faith. Many saw it too, and soon crowds from all over Metro Manila and the outlying provinces flocked to Granja. The phenomenon received considerable print, TV and radio coverage. The luminous figure was visible from about 6.30 in the evening to the early hours of dawn. Some say other figures were visible as well, such as that of St. Bernadette, and others claim to have seen tiny twinkling lights dotting the leaves of the coconut tree. Some theorize that the image was merely projected onto the leaf by some trickster, or the reflection from the nearby lamppost but others counted that it couldn't have been a reflection as the image would remain intact on the leaf no matter the direction the wind would blow it to. But there are those who claim to have seen more than an illumination on a leaf. When we arrived there at the scene and look upon the tree, instead of seeing the Fatima, I told my wife, no, it's not the Fatima, it's the Our Lady of Miraculous Medal because the veil is blue, it's not all white, and, and, his, and her hair is spread like this. So, I, and my mother, ah, I'm seeing also the same thing. I was crying, I was trembling. The silhouette was visible for 90 consecutive evenings. Then, on May 21st, the day after the silhouette ceased to appear, Sister Alphonse, the nun who had seen Teresing's sightless eyes in 1948, passed away. We were told that before she died, she had repeatedly asked when she would be interviewed for the Keithley report, as she had much to tell. Her dying request was to have the image of Our Lady Mediatrix of All Grace exposed in the chapel of Carmel. The day afterwards, with the permission of Archbishop Gaviola, the controversial statue was brought out and displayed for the first time in over 40 years. On January 24, 1991, petals were again reported to have fallen at Lipa, Carmel. Terry Singh, her driver, and a real estate agent were inside the church in front of the statue of the Mediatrix when petals suddenly fell from nowhere. Yung roses, parang nagmula sa kawalan, malalam, mataas pa dito sa halaman na ito. At unti-unting nagkalaglagan, parang hindi basta bigla, yung parang nagsiswing kung mag, ano, paglaglag. Ngayon, puting-puti ang mga roses. Wala nang pure na pure na puti. Hindi, hindi kami magsalita. Ako pang Panginoon, kako. Patawarin mo po ako, kako. Nangungas agad ako, kako. Kako, kung ito man, kako, may lagro. Kako, patawarin niyo po ako, kako. Nandiyan. Naku, so, uh, nung nakita ni Sister Sin, oh, naku, sabi niya, nang binagro si Mama Mary, it's miracle, it's miracle. The incident made a deep impression upon Mang Maning. Ang um, kuwan ko ba, yung, yung feeling ko ba sa Panginoon na na Parang ako, baka may minsahe sa akin na ano, minag, pinagminagroan ako kasi hindi ko naman ako palasimbay. Ngayon, mula noon, binigyan ako ni Sister Celine ng 
ng Bible at saka prayer book at saka ano, sabi magsimba. At parang damdamin ko parang ayawan ko ba, hindi ko ma-explain sa iyo. <laughs> Kasi minsan, alam mo, pag ganyan, parang ko na ko parang emo, laki ng um, laki ng emosyon ko hindi ko mapili parang maluwa ba ako ma pero sa talang buhay ko hindi pa ko uh, kahit ano mga problema a few days afterwards six children playing in the garden at Carmel reportedly saw the statue of the Virgin of Carmel come to life nakita ko po eh, nag yung pong mata ay lumuluha po saka po yung papo ay nag close feet Noong po kami nagdasal, nakita ko pong umiiyak. Bago pagkatapos po namin magdasal, umiti po. Malambot. Yung ano po, damit. Noong inawakan ko po dun sa damit, eh, malambot po. Inawakan ko po yung, yung pong damit. Eh, lumubog po yung ano, yung kamay po. Ay, yung pong kamay ko. Lumubog po, lampasan po. Nakita ko po, ito pong damit po ay nasasalimpar po ng hangin. Ginawaan ko po yung, yung palad. Eh, na, naramdaman ko po na malambot. Pagkahalik ko po sa paa, na, nakita ko po na naramdaman po. Naramdaman ko po. Um, para nga po ang um, paa na nagalaw. This is extraordinary. And it is another factor for me to be prompted to 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 study this really in the last six months petal showers occurred with some regularity in terracing's home you sort of hear on this level fluttering sort of suspended in the air in fact the petal showers progressed to another stage several witnesses were present when full roses materialized out of thin air and landed on the stairs altar and bedroom of the Castilla home and terracing reports with joy and apprehension that she has begun to receive messages from Mary again. If at all we are going to reopen this, we will do this as secretly as possible, as, as privately as possible, so that the composition or the members of the commission will not be under some sort of uh, too much uh, pressure and they might be exposed to even their own personal biases. On July 16, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Archbishop Mariano Gaviola declared that the controversial image of Mary Mediatrix of All Grace would, for the entire duration of his term as Archbishop, be exposed to the public in the chapel of the Carmelite convent of Vipa. The list of healings attributed to the petals and intercession of the Mediatrix continues to grow and lay groups are busily gathering the testimonies. Prayers continue at Carmel every Saturday and penitential processions wind their way around the town. The wait is on. In the meantime, after more than 40 years, it's showering petals again. Today's world can dismiss the petal showers as merely paranormal instead of supernatural, insisting that certain individuals are capable of bringing about incidents of extraordinary phenomena. We can always explain everything away. But then the question is, through all this rationalization, where have we left room for God? This is June Keithley for the sixth in the series of The Woman Clothed with the Sun.